Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rod Hardiman, the chair of the Friends of African and African American Art Auxiliary here at the DIA, or affectionately known as FA. The Friends of African and African American Art is one of the Detroit Institute of Art's oldest auxiliaries. Initially founded in 1962 to assist the foundation of the museum's African gallery, the organization expanded its purview in 1992 to include African American art. Today, FAS supports programs to educate our public about the artistic legacy of Africans on the continent and the African diaspora. Over the years, it has also funded numerous art acquisitions, some of which grace our permanent galleries today. 
We pride ourselves on having interesting and active dialogue and programming and cultural trips to continuously uh, engage the community and the public and enrich our, all, our collective experiences. In 2005, the Friends established the Margaret H. Dumont Award in memory of Dumont, a founding member, museum patron, and avid collector of African art. The honor was, has since gone to scholars, museum professionals, collectors, and artists who have contributed to developing and promoting African art. To, to introduce today's program, I would love to bring to you all Dr. Ni nee Kwakopong, the curator and department, uh, the curator and department of African and Oceania and Indigenous Americas at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Ni, nee, come to the stage and tell us more about our wonderful programming here today. Thank you, Rod, um, for um, the, your introduction. Um, I am going to start the program and I want to welcome all of you to this um, afternoon's conversation. Um, in 2017, French President Macron, speaking in Burkina Faso, announced his government's intention to repatriate African artworks seized or looted by France from its colonial territories. He subsequently set up a commission headed by Benedict Savoy, a French art historian, and Felwyn Saar, a Senegalese economist, to submit concrete proposals for returning African artifacts as permanent or temporary restitutions. Since the report was published in 2018, many museums have started reviewing the ownership histories of their collections. In addition, discussions, symposia, and studies have occurred, and books and articles have been published on restitution indicating that the subject is no longer forbidden in the museum world. Yet long before Macron's announcement, Dr. Kwame Opoku today's honoree was already an unwavering voice in developing and distributing African knowledge about restitution in Africa, garnering over 300 articles on the subject since 2005. Because of his years of advocacy and demonstrated passion, it was no surprise that he was invited to serve on the experts commission that assisted Benedict Savoy and Felwyn Saar in producing the Saar Savoy report on restitution. In presenting Dr. Kwame Opoku with the award, the Friends of African and African American Arts recognizes his immense and continued influence in driving and shaping the debates about restitution, equity, and social justice in African art. Dr. Poku joins a distinguished group as past recipients of this award have included the late Nigerian National Museum director, Dr. Epoeyo, world acclaimed ceramic artist, Magdalene Odundo, and African art luminaries like professors, Roland Abiodun, and the late Robert Faris Thompson. Usually this ceremony is an in-person event. However, following Doctor's advice to Dr. Opoku, who lives in Vienna, Austria, to avoid long distance travel for health reasons, the FAAA decided to hold the program virtually. At this stage, I would like to invite Dr. Salvador Salot Pons, President, CEO, and Director of the Detroit Institute of Arts, to hand over the plaque and read the citation. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Quarka Palm, and welcome everyone to the presentation of the award, as well as the uh, lecture by Dr. Opoku. I now would like uh, Dr. Kwame Opoku to be pleased to present you with the Margaret Hearst Demand Award on behalf of the Friends of African and African American Art in recognition of your work in driving and shaping the current debate on restitution, equity, and social justice in African art. The museum field does not take these issues lightly, so we look forward to hearing your experiences and views about them to help us chart the way forward. My warmest congratulations, Dr. Apok. Thank you. Uh, 
I am greatly honored and humbled by this award, which puts me in the company of an illustrious scholar such as Echo Ayo. I hope I can transmit some of his enthusiasm for the protection and restitution of African art. Thank you very much for this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going on now to the program and I want to introduce our honoree. Dr. Kwame Tua Opoku was born and received his early education in Ghana, West Africa, before proceeding to the University of London School of Economics for his Bachelor of Law degree in 1963. He proceeded to the University of Chicago for his Master's in Comparative Law after a brief two-year teaching of public international law and jurisprudence at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. He went to the University of Aix Marcel in France, where he received a doctorate in jurisprudence. He was a research fellow at the Hamburg and Max Planck Institutes in Germany from 1970 to 1975. He then taught public international law and comparative government at the universities of Hamburg and Marburg before obtaining a second doctorate in jurisprudence from the University of Bremen, Germany in 1978. Subsequently, he joined the United Nations, serving as deputy legal advisor of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and then as legal advisor to the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The Commission on uh, the Status of Women and various preparatory committees for UN conferences, including the United Nations Conference for the Promotion of International Cooperation in the Peaceful Uses of Nuclear Energy, and then the fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. From 1988 to 1989, he was also legal advisor to the United Nations Transition Assistance Group in Namibia, and in 2000 to the Special Representative of the Secretary General to Namibia, Marty Atisari. Until his retirement in 2005, he was the legal advisor and then the Ombudsman at the United Nations office in Vienna. Uh, in Vienna. Following, following Dr. Poku's tenure at the United Nations, he became actively involved in advocacy for the return of looted art in Western museums, not just from Africa, but from all around the globe. He was a lone voice on this issue at one point, but now his views about Western museums, questionable ownership of some objects from the non-Western world, which previously sounded radical and foreboding, um, you know, have, have proved uh, prescient. The increase in focus on provenance research and the shift toward decolonizing museums have shown that he was far ahead of the times. But most importantly, as most people do over time, he has also evolved. Consequently, in this conversation, I want to have him speak not just on the issue of restitution, but also on other relevant topics concerning African arts collecting and museums. We will have a 15 to 20 minute question and answer afterward. Please send your questions to Dr. Poku via the chat. Uh, question and answer um, moderator, Asma Walton, will read them aloud for Dr. Poku to respond. Please note that regardless of whether your question makes it, it is still important to us. Without much ado, and um, without much ado, could you join me in welcoming Dr. Kwame Opoku from Vienna? Austria. Welcome, Dr. Poku. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I'm to begin our forward. conversation, yes. Um, yes. you have written, 
Yeah. Um, you have written about two, 300 articles about the restitution and repatriation of looted African artifacts in Western museums. How did you come to this subject and what kept you going despite the lack of positive response from the West? Well, thank you very much. Um, I shall not go to my infancy. I will start at the last uh, stage, last uh, motivation for writing. That is uh, 2007. There was a famous and magnificent exhibition entitled Benin Kings and Rituals, Court Art from Nigeria in Vienna in the Volker Kunde Museum, now called World Museum. During this symposium, there was, uh, during this exhibition, there was a symposium on the, on the Benin artworks, and a part of it was devoted to, um, to artifacts. During the debate on the uh, Benin artifacts, the Benin royal delegation uh, stated that they would be very pleased and satisfied if the number of Western museums that are represented at this uh, symposium, each of them returned to Benin one artifact. The then director of the Volker Kunde Museum responded very quickly, saying that it was impossible to think of them returning even one. I stood up and objected to this uh, viewpoint. And I realized at that symposium how determined the Western museums were to keep the Benin artifacts which had been looted from Benin by uh, the British punitive expedition in 1897. I decided, therefore, that I should devote myself to looking into the question. Very few persons were really um, interested in my articles. Most of them thought it was completely useless because the Western states and museums had decided not to listen to the demands for restitution, uh, which were coming in from the African states and more or less from various uh, individuals. One person, however, uh, a Dutchman, Tom Kremers, uh, thought I had some useful contribution to make. I had hardly written more than one or two articles when he made a column on his website entitled Dr. Kwame Opoku's Writings. I was rather embarrassed and said, look, if somebody should go into this uh, site, he would find only two articles and so entitled in rather pompous way. So I decided either I can ask him not to mention my name at all, or I have to take the challenge and actually write a few more articles. So I started setting myself a limit of five more, uh, 10 more, 20 more, 30 more, and the more I wrote, the more I realized that there were many more things that uh, had to be looked into. So this is how I came to writing about the uh, artifacts. The more I wrote, the more I enjoyed looking into the question. And so it became what some people said was my passion. Others thought it was an obsession. But anyway, however you describe it, I devoted my time to the restitution of the Benin artifacts. That's how I came about it. Thank you. Well, um, regarding actual restitutions to date, what yeah. successes can you list and what are the prospects? Yes, this is a very interesting question. Although everybody is writing about artifacts, about restitution, uh, since the uh, SARS Abor report, there's hardly a day you don't uh, you don't see at least three articles about the issue. Uh, the actual number of artifacts which have been uh, returned 
are not all that overwhelming. Uh, but in, in considering the numbers, what we should really be thinking about is not so much how many there are and how many more there are to it, but the very fact that now, in contrast to previous periods, people actually talk about restitution of artifacts, and we've actually had some concrete cases, which I'll mention later, of a restitution. In the olden days, if I may so use an expression, that is before uh, 2000, 2005, before uh, 2017, that is before Macron and so, uh, the word restitution was hardly used and it was regarded by many as rather a proclamation of a dangerous era. And so people avoided it. So the fact that we now have a period where people talk openly about restitution, even museum officials talk about restitution, is itself a great uh, change. On the actual numbers, the numbers started by France itself after the Sarsavoy report, restoring or restituting to Benin Republic, which is not to be confused with the Kingdom of Benin in Nigeria, Benin Republic, former French uh, colony. Uh, the French restituted to Benin 26 artifacts, including the famous Dahomean uh, royal artifacts, which had been in museum in Cape Only, and two items, one sort of uh, of a, of a famous um, Tukulo leader, Omar Saidu Tal, who fought the French. These two were uh, restituted to Senegal, and then Germany returned to Nigeria 1,130 uh, Artifacts, not the artifacts itself, not physical, but the legal rights in the artifacts were restituted by Germany. And actually, Germany later also sent the ministers, German ministers went to Nigeria with uh, some two articles plus 28 cents by, by plane. And then you had University of Cambridge, Jesus College, returning one Benin cockerel to, uh, to the Oba of Benin. The same was a commemorative head by the University of uh, Aberdeen. And then the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of African uh, Art returned the legal rights in uh, 29 Benin artifacts to Nigeria while retaining a few, about eight objects on loan. The Metropolitan Museum of in New York returned to Nigeria three Benin artifacts without saying much about the 160 or so other Benin artifacts the museum had. The Horniman Museum in uh, London retained seven, uh, the, the legal rights in 72 Benin artifacts to Nigeria while retaining a few on loan. The Rautenstrau Museum in Cologne, Cologne, Cologne uh, retained 92 artifacts to Benin, uh, rights in the artifacts to Benin while retaining a few on loan. Cambridge University okay. Archaeological and Anthropological Museum, as well as the Oxford University Pitt Rivers Museum, uh, intended to return to Nigeria uh, a large number of artifacts pending an agreement which was okay. to be signed. They never came, okay. they never signed the agreement. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. um, in the ongoing debate, it is clear not every African art object in Western museums is rooted 
Indeed, not every African society suffered the colonial wars that engulfed the kingdoms like Benin, Dahomey, and Asante. Instead, many objects have also been legitimately acquired in the last 60 years after colonization. Some were sold by Africans directly to foreigners and others through the um, public auctions. Have you considered these distinctions in uh, the methods of acquisition in your calls for object repatriation? Thank you. I'm glad you're asking this question because often when it is said that a claim for restitution is being made, or at least when people like me call for restitution, they're asking for all the artifacts in the museum to be returned to Africa. Uh, this is a ploy to create the impression that we are vandals who want to destroy the museums, who want to take everything out of the museum. It is definitely not so. The, 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 what we have been pleading for, and that is what most of the people who support uh, restitution mean, is that those artifacts, those objects which were taken under the colonial uh, regime, which were taken by force or without the consent of the owners, have to be returned. It's not all the artifacts in the uh, museums that were stolen. That has to be made clear. Although sometimes people like the British, the then British Prime Minister, who said he doesn't believe in returnism, because if you return one, the whole museum will be emptied. I mean, that gives the impression that all museum objects have been stolen. None of us, and definitely I do not believe that all the objects in the museum uh, are stolen. So it's only those which have been uh, acquired by force or in the dubious, under dubious circumstances. And we are thinking of many of the artifacts which, for instance, were acquired by the French ex uh, expedition to uh, Africa, the so-called Dakar Djibouti expedition, 1931-33, which amassed lots of objects from Senegal on that way to Ethiopia and then back to France. They collected artifacts in fairly uh, suspicious ways. The, the actions of this uh, this expedition are really very interesting and anybody who is interested in restitution should read the book by uh, Michel Leris, Africa Phantom or Africa Phantom. Michel Leris was the secretary of this group. He was the one who noted, the, he was the archivist who noted the activities of this group and he has described how they used all kinds of devices, tricks, and all sorts of uh, threats to get these artifacts. About 3,000 3, of them, mostly in Musée de Cave only. And uh, those are the things that we are interested in getting back. The same as some of those objects, which the missionaries said represented paganism, and should be destroyed and collected. Uh, they destroyed, the missionaries destroyed a few of them symbolically, but a lot ended in museums in France, Switzerland, Germany. And often when you look at catalogs of auctions, it is stated a gift by a priest or donated by a priest. And these are mostly objects that have been uh, uh, acquired in this way. That's what we are claiming, and that's what everybody claims. There's no intention to empty museums of their African artifacts. Uh, um, thank you very much. Um, well, um, the other issue has to do with Western museums and education. Most Western museums pride themselves as great institutions of learning. 
many are fulfilling this role quite admirably. Um, given the calls for repatriation, how do you see African art playing a role in Western Museum's efforts to educate the world about the continent, its cultures and history? The museums are well placed to play an important role in teaching uh, the world about African culture, African customs, and it is not just the world, but even many of us Africans learned about African culture from what we see in the museums. Because for most of the time, and even to the present day, you cannot see many African objects in Africa itself. So it's those of us who have been fortunate enough to go to places like London, Paris, and Berlin, who can study some of these things. So the museums have a very important role still to play in the question of education about uh, African culture. But one thing the museums will have to do is to abandon some of the uh, funny, not to say dangerous theories they had about Africans and about the savage or primitive nature of Africans and above all, some of the ideas they seem to have inherited from the European uh, enlightenment, which created a scale of development of humanity in which the Europeans are on top and we Africans are below and which was used as a justification for collecting uh, African uh, artifacts in the belief that we were going to disappear, our societies would disappear. So there's none of the truth in this. If the museums would uh, change the attitudes, if they would renounce uh, such uh, documents and declarations as a declaration on the value and importance of Universal Museums, uh, 2002, uh, which claimed that the major museums were holding artifacts, these uh, artifacts, not only from Africa, but from uh, Latin America and uh, Asia on behalf of humanity. If they would abandon these uh, theories and finally accept that they have no right of oversight over African artifacts and what we do with the artifacts, if they would, throw aside some of these mistakes of the past, I think they still have a very bright uh, future. They can do a lot of good. And I think none of us who have actually visited all these museums in the West, I've spent my time visiting quite a lot of them in various countries. None of us really wants to see these museums disappear, but we argue for the museums to retain some of those artifacts which were wrongly uh, seized from the Africans. Because many African museums are empty or almost empty. They don't have enough of African artifacts. That has to be uh, corrected. And the museums should, this is my own personal request, the museums should stop feeling guilty and feel they must defend practices of the past, which are now being criticized everywhere. Nobody holds the, the museum directors of, the, of this generation responsible for uh, those activities, but they are responsible for not reacting to requests for restitution of some of the uh, African artifacts. And I say some, with intention to draw your attention to the fact that a famous museum director of the United States, like uh, Philip de Montebello, when I wrote that some of the artifacts they have in these museums will have to be returned to Africa, to the African country, he wrote a response which you can read is in the internet in which he says Dr. Opoku wants all artifacts produced in Nigeria, uh, Yoruba, 
Benin, Ibo, et cetera, et cetera, not to be returned to uh, Nigeria. That, of course, was a mischievous interpretation. Uh, if the museums will abandon these ideas and concentrate on their main work of informing and educating people about other cultures, I think they would have made a great contribution. Um, I have seen um, to, um, to the point that you've just made, um, um, somebody online has indicated that West Africa is not the only place calling for repatriation. You know, places like Kenya are also um, attempting to reclaim their looted objects. You know, have, you, have you dealt with that? Thank you very much. It's not only West Africa. There are places like Egypt, if you want to uh, go deep into the it's Egypt, which has been claiming for the return of the Nefertiti and the Rosetta Stone and a few other uh, items taken from Egypt. Uh, Ethiopia is also a good example. You would no doubt remember the invasion of Ethiopia uh, at Martella and the artifacts which were taken from there, uh, thousands of them, which are now all in, um, in uh, most of them in the uh, London, British Museum in London, in the uh, Albert and Victoria Museum, and in the, uh, yes, and, and many others. And of course, Asante, uh, artifacts which are also in the uh, Wallace collection and the British Museum and, and in East Africa there are quite a lot of claims from Kenya, claims from Uganda, from Rwanda and uh, Namibia. There are many other uh, African countries. It's a, an African-wide uh, problem. It's not uh, in any way uh, confined to West Africa. But one, the literature on West Africa is probably much more detailed and more frequent. And coming myself from Ghana, it's obvious that I have to look close to my own area, but my interest is much wider. My interest goes over the whole uh, continent. And indeed, not only the African continent, but also to Greece, and uh, the, a lot of the other Asian um, countries. If you have time, you can look into my writings and you would see I've dealt with practically every continent. Yes. Thank you. Um, now to the issue of ethics and morality. Mm -hmm. Are ethics and morality crucial in the debate about repatriation and restitution of African artifacts? That's a very interesting and good question, which I think should occupy quite a lot of our time and a lot of us. Previously, many of the defendants, uh, defendants of museums uh, used to say that the law at the time when these artifacts were seized or stolen or however you describe them, the law permitted that, uh, but they would all agree with you that morally speaking, this was wrong. So you have a situation of even officials of the British Museum saying that the attack on Benin was morally uh, wrong, but legally, it's okay. Uh, they cannot return it. The law prevents them from retaining it. But over time, morality and ethics have gradually become relevant in the discussions on restitution. A very 
important example, for instance, is the uh, ethical return policy of the uh, Smithsonian uh, African uh, Museum. They have actually adopted a policy of ethical uh, restitution. And you have many, I don't, we don't have the time to go into this, but there are many um, museum officials who have uh, vehemently insisted that morality should be a standard. Again, coming to Smithsonian, I remember, uh, what's her name? Ingairi Blankenberg was a, a director of the African, the Smithsonian African um, Museum. She was very uh, influential in Smithsonian adopting this policy of ethical returns. She did not stay long in that museum, uh, an indication that not everybody agrees. But for the time being, and in the last few uh, years, whether in Germany or even in England, and all those uh, countries where artifacts are being disputed, people are spoken about morality and ethics. And there's a feeling in the museum world that ethical considerations are important uh, for restitution. And I think what we will have to do, we try to do, is to broaden the role of ethics in, uh, in the question of restitution. In other words, if something is wrong, the museums must admit that this is wrong, that it's wrong, for instance, to, uh, to burn a city like Kumasi after having taken its artifacts, keep the artifacts for more than a hundred years and still refuse to return them. One should ask oneself, what is the right thing to do? And try to see you can, uh, if it can be done. The British, for instance, are hiding behind uh, the British Museum Act of 1963. Uh, but a lot of them will tell you morally it's wrong to keep the Benin artifacts, wrong to keep the Ethiopian artifacts, etc., etc. But their hands are tied. They cannot return uh, these objects. Now, if morality plays the role that we think it should play, uh, we will solve these problems of restitution pretty soon because all these armed aggressions against poorer and weaker countries clearly by our standards today, maybe at the standards at the time when they occurred, uh, they were all right, but by our standards today, everybody will agree it is wrong. And we can only apply our standards to our activities not the standards of the past. Uh, and the problems we are talking about are not past problems. They are problems of today. What we are talking about is not really to apportion blame or not blame uh, between countries. What we are talking about is the imbalance of artifacts, African artifacts found in European Western museums and those found in African uh, countries. And we are saying the Europeans, the Westerners would have to return a few. We will have to return. And Nigeria and Germany have found a way. They found a way of discussing and resolving some of these issues. We may not agree with all that the Nigerians have done, but at least the Germans and the Nigerians have reached a way of returning artifacts without emptying the uh, German museum. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, 
in the effort to decolonize museums, do you see any opportunities at all for African and Western collaboration or cooperation in the future? Yes, there is no doubt. I've always said that Africa and Europe are bound together, whether we like it or not. We are neighbors, although that sounds very difficult for some people to understand. Africa and Europe are neighbors. From the southern tip of Europe to the northern tip of Africa, it's only 10 kilometers or so. And you can stand in some parts of Spain and Gibraltar and places like this on a very clear day, you can see Africa on the other side. So we are bound to cooperate. And that applies also to uh, the museums. But as I said already, the museums, the Western museums would have to abandon certain ideas and practices. What also has to be done, and I have said this in many of my writings, but nobody seems really to, to be concerned, is that we should have exchanges, not only of African artifacts, but also European art should be uh, found in Africa. In other words, it's not only the Europeans who need to know about African art, the Africans also need to know about European art. If there's ignorance about African art in Europe, so there is ignorance about European art in Africa, excepting the specialist who have studied these problems. The average man on the street in Accra doesn't know much about European art. So don't we need also to know? We are neighbors, as I've said. We have to know about each other. And this is something the museums can also do. They can arrange, exchange information with African museums, organize displays of European art, in uh, Africa the same way as they organize displays of African art in Europe. Well, <laughs> that's, um, thank you so much. Um, I have one last question um, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Um, somebody, a, a close colleague of mine, uh, Ray, Raymond Silverman has asked, why has Ghana, quote and unquote, Asante, compared to other African nations, not be more vocal in demanding the return of the loot that the British took from Kumasi during the Anglo-Asante Wars of the 19th century. Thank you very much. This is something very close to my heart. I should disclose that I spent my youth in Kumasi. And as some of you may see by my dress, that. I am from Kumasi, and the artifacts, the question of artifacts, the Asante artifacts, is very close to my heart. This is a question which I had, uh, I could say with that as a creation, that since the age of four, the age of four, I have been thinking about these things regarding Ashanti. How do I come to that at the age of four? My father's office, the first office of my father I got to know, was across the street from the Kumasi Fort, which is now a military museum. And there we saw many objects, like the cannon, which is a place right in front of the uh, museum. So the Asante, Anglo-Asante wars and the constant invasion of Asante, and of course the incursions of the Ashantis to the south, uh, southeast, south central uh, in Ghana is something which I have always been interested in. And I must also reveal to you that I was born close to the various European forts on the south in Elmina, Cape Coast, and all these forts. I used to see every three months when I went on holidays to visit my grandmother who is from there. So the relations between Britain and the Gold Coast then and all these Asante wars 
are something which have interested me uh, very much. You are right in saying Ghana has not been very vocal. It's a mystery to me too. I have asked people who should be concerned about these things. Uh, for some reason, which I don't know, they will probably reveal to us sometime, they are not pressing the matter. It's like many African countries which tell you that they are very proud of African culture and all the rest. But when it comes to putting in a little effort for, for the return of these objects, they are very reluctant without any obvious uh, reason. I can suppose that is the strong influence of the Western museums over some of these countries, and Ghana in particular, uh, that for one reason or the other, they are not very active. Even Nigeria, which has now been bold enough to write to the British Museum and ask them to When I started writing, Nigeria was not even interested, or at least those officials in Nigeria who were supposed to be looking after these artifacts, they were not very enthusiastic about bringing the case of Benin even before the UNESCO uh, uh, committee. So it's still a mystery to me. In my last articles, I have said clearly what I think should be done about the Asante uh, artifacts. Uh, if I have written a lot about Benin, it was the, for the simple reason that I come from Ghana and I come from Kumasi, that I did not want to write immediately about the Asante artifacts, because the conclusion to my argument will seem obvious to everybody, that he has, of course, to come to this conclusion. So my idea, which I sold to many people, let's concentrate on Benin. And once we finish with Benin, we go to Asante. So after Benin is Asante gold. After Benin bronze is Asante gold. And that's where we are now. Those who are not doing much to foster this, they mu you must, we must ask them to explain. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think I will, I will um, um, move to um, Asma Walton to begin reading out the questions mm -hmm. from the online chat. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to apologize now because I'm a bit under the weather, but I'm going to get through these questions. Um, so we got a few a few questions in before um, the conversation today. So I'm going to start with those. So the first question we have is which, if any, legal methods are most effective in achieving restitution of stolen artifacts? Has litigation been successful or are there alternative um, dispute resolution methods uh, more effective? It's a very interesting question, fundamental question, which has been raised. In this area, law, morality, and other methods are all involved. We have to use all of them depending on the particular situation. You ask me which one is more effective. You have to look at the nature of restitution. You have to look at the nature of uh, the colonial system and the armed aggression, etc. Principally, the attacks on all these countries have been on orders of governments even the colonial armies, whether it's the French army in uh, Dahomey in 1892 or the British in uh, Ghana, then Gokos in 1874 or in Ethiopia, 1860, I think. Yeah, 
all these attacks have been on government orders. They have been by organized military personnel of the executive branch of the government. So basically, restitution, from my own point of view, is a political question. It's not a legal question, as far as I'm concerned. It's a political question with legal aspects. If you can get to the political authorities of a country responsible for looting your artifacts, you stand by far better chance of getting some of your artifacts, if not all, than getting to the judicial authority. First of all, you get to the court, there are also some procedural rules which can be used to stop you right from the beginning so that the substance of the issue might never even be discussed. And there are laws in many countries, like in France, they have this principle of inalienability, uh, which makes it impossible to get any object which has been entered into the property of the state. But if you get the government, and this has been demonstrated in the last uh, few years by Macron, who said, I cannot accept that a large majority of African artifacts are in French uh, museums and private collections, that this has to be changed, that the African artifacts have to be shown in uh, Dakar, Lagos, Cotino, and that he was going to do something about it. And he did something about it by getting uh, the French parliament to pass a law authorizing the 26 artifacts I mentioned at the beginning uh, were returned to Benin, as well as the two uh, objects, the uh, sword and the, its uh, sheath to Senegal. So it's the government, the political authority, which accepts that there has to be a change and it gets it done. You are not going to be able to get much through the courts. We should remember that here we are not dealing with private stolen items, like your neighbor or somebody else has stolen your, your object. You can try to get the courts to do it. But in the case of uh, restitution, you may have one or two cases where you can perhaps, uh, through legal means, uh, obtain your thing. This is very rare. What you can do, of course, with legal procedures, you can stop auctioneers and people like that from selling your artifacts. That gives you time to contact the governments and to try uh, to negotiate with them. So I would say, if you ask me, as a somebody who has studied law for years and years, I would prefer you get to the political authorities than to the judicial authorities. Thank you. All right. Um, so the next question that we have, should a restitution negotiation be with the national government or indigenous community from where the objects originated? If the latter, how do you identify the original owners? This is a very interesting question. And uh, it definitely comes from somebody who has spent some time thinking about these issues. You, you have to look into the situation of the African countries. And if you look carefully, you'd realize that in all these African countries, whether Ghana, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and all these countries, what people call communities are not communities, in my opinion, they are nations. 
There are nations like the Asante nation, Benin nation, and the Dahomean nation, which have a complete set of system, social and political systems. They are nations. The wars which were fought in all these places, whereby the Asante nation, the Dahomean, or uh, the Benin. So we reach a position where these nations, or what you call communities, <clears throat> have been very strong in places like Nigeria and Ghana. The history of those countries can be explained by looking at these so-called communities, etc. They are very powerful, even though now most of them do not have a significant political role to play in the countries because the constitutions which these countries have have given the power to the central government. Now, when it comes to restitution, you would find that most of those objects are objects which have been produced by the so-called communities those I call nations, like the Asantis or the uh, Ibos or the, the uh, Benin or um, whichever other group you care about. They have produced these objects which were seized by the European armies. So now you want to return these objects. Who are your partners? On the international uh, level, at the international level, of course, you have to deal with states. The states are better organized to deal with the other states like Germany or France, etc. But the people who are really interested in the artifacts have been these so-called communities, if you like or what are called these nations or proto-nations, or whatever you like, they are those who are really interested. And in some cases, they are the ones who urge the central government to pursue this matter. So if you ask, so with whom am I negotiating? With whom am I dealing? I would say the answer is, of course, you are negotiating with the state, because at the international level, it's the state state of Ghana, state of Nigeria, etc., which is uh, responsible for all that is in their territory. But these objects do not belong to the states as such. They belong to the communities where these objects came from. And often they are the ones pushing. Don't forget that, for instance, in Nigeria, it has from time immemorial, being the Benin Uba, who has been fighting for the return of the Benin objects. Often one had the impression that the federal government was not really that interested. It had other priorities, was not pushing for this. And even some of the officials, like the in the National Commission, etc., they have other priorities. Whereas the Uba is totally committed to getting these uh, artifacts back. So then you get into problems of often wondering whether you should talk to the Oba, especially if the Oba or the, the, the chiefs are not in agreement with the central government. You ask yourself, whom am I dealing with, etc. But the Nigerian government, has done something which I think was quite wise. As it seemed, there was some dispute between the OBA and the state governor, as well as the National Commission. The president came out clearly and said, it's the OBA who has right to these objects which are being returned. And he clearly define the role of the National Commission, that they negotiate these things with the foreign institutions. But when the objects come to Nigeria, they go to where 
they were taken from. And I think that's a good solution because if you spent, if you send these objects to the central government, perhaps the rich people who have no idea or are not spiritually or emotionally connected to these things. So the further development cannot be expected. They may be interested for reasons of tourism, getting these objects in the capital, but for the development, for the further development of these cultures, which are represented by the artifacts, you need the people in whose uh, palaces or houses these things were uh, originally and were taken. I have no doubt in my mind, and I've written it and said it clearly, although some people might not appreciate this viewpoint. I have said, for instance, the Asante items that are in, uh, in Britain, London, should be returned to Kumasi, and I've given the exact address of where it should be sent, not just Kumasi, but to the Menshia Palace, to the place where they were taken from. The same applies also to Benin. These objects should be returned to the Uber of Benin. One Englishman, Doctor of Medicine, I think, Doctor Mark Walker. He returned to Benin two Benin artifacts which had been stolen in 1897 and were in the um, in the hands of his family. His great-grandfather had been one of the uh, soldiers in the Benin expedition, and he kept a few things. I think it was a bell and a bed or so. Mm -hmm. Dr. Walker mm -hmm. took them 2014, I think. He took these things and returned them to the Oba of Benin. There had been some squabbles about whether he should send them to La, uh, to Lagos or to Abuja and keep them there or to the Uber. Finally, they were sent to the um, Uba of Benin. And you should see the joy that this brought to the people of Benin. So my question then, answer, short answer, if you ignore all the long explanations, the short answer is that you'll be dealing with both. On the international level, with the government, central government. But when it comes to the actual place where these things are to be sent, you'll be dealing with the, uh, what you call communities. I say they are not communities because communities give the impression of a couple of hundreds of people who live in in a neighborhood or a district or somewhere. But I mean, the Benin people form a nation. The Asante's form a nation. The Europeans and all these, they are going to their millions. So the description communities give the impression of a few scattered groups here and there. Uh, they are a bit more than that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So the next question we have, has any foreign government or museums returning African artifacts compensated the rightful um, owner? This is a, a very, <laughs> a very heavy question, I might say. No, not as far as I'm aware. And the question of compensation, I think, should be considered seriously, and it should be accepted that after Britain has kept Asante artifacts for since uh, 1874, or Britain kept the uh, Benin artifacts since 1897 and sold uh, some to American museums who knew these were stolen, 
or to Germany, which knew these things were stolen, there should be a payment of a kind. Symbolic, if you like. But when I say symbolic, I don't mean one dollar. I'm thinking of a couple of millions. After you've kept the artifacts of these people for over 100 years and deprived them of the use of the artifacts. And you know, and that's what many people might choose to ignore. These artifacts are for the many African people, not just objects of beauty, uh, of aesthetic, you know, perfection, etc. They are objects which really embody the spirit of their ancestors and their people. And when these things are not there, people feel the society is running a danger. The society and any problem which occurs in the society, they believe it was because they are missing some of these uh, objects. A good example is from Cameroon, these uh, uh, Ngoso uh, lady, founder of uh, a people, the Ngoso in uh, Cameroon. Many of the people said that all the problems you've had in these years were due to the fact that these things are missing because they cannot lead their lives the way they were supposed to lead. And by the way, this brings me to one point which we have not discussed and I don't think we want to start it now, is the one of the return of human remains. It's also something which bothers a lot of people in Africa. Many think they are facing disasters because they have not been able to bury their ancestors in the uh, correct way according to fashion. So I would say that compensation, yes. The real question about compensation is how much? And on that, I think we can set up a few scholars and judges to work out the compensation. And this would also interest people in Africa or all Africans, those abroad, those in the diaspora, is that if you cannot get, if you cannot get compensation for the artifacts, for the loss of the artifacts, it might be difficult to ask for compensation for the broader losses experienced in slavery or in colonial uh, servitude. So this is the question. I personally believe there should be compensation. How much is this? I don't know. But at least it has to be admitted that if you deprive somebody of the right to use his own artifact, you have to compensate in one way or the other. And that has to be admitted. Thank you. All right. So the next question we have is, what can the average citizen um, do to support the quest for restitution? Uh -huh. This is very interesting. And the advice I would give, I'm not sure the museum people will like it, <laughs> but I would say the average citizen should inform himself about the museums and what they are doing. What are the museums doing about looted artifacts? They should concern and consult his favorite museum or to find out what they are doing, to get information about what artifacts are disputed and see what he can do to support restitution. I'm not in favor of him going into the museum and taking an object or something of that nature, you know, uh, but at least he should inform himself, know what the problems are and what he can do. 
because you can't, I can't give an advice on what you should do when I don't know which museum you are dealing with and what the problems there are. So it's to inform yourself and also to talk about the issue. One of my main concerns when I started writing, people asked me, do you think your writings will bring back artifacts? I said that was not my aim. My aim was to get people talking about it, people discussing. Because one of the things I found in this area, there's so much ignorance about the restitution question. People don't know about it. And there are many good citizens in all these places, I'm sure in Detroit, everywhere, who are shocked to hear that you have in the museum a looted object. Like in Vienna, I spoke to some children. They were really shocked. They said, are you telling us there are looted items in our museum here? Yes. So it's informing yourself, talking to your local museum people to see what can be done. Fortunately, in our time, many museums are really in favor of restitution. They cannot do it overnight, but they are favorable and they are willing to talk about these things and willing to inform you and to help reduce your ignorance. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let me jump into some of these questions that we got in during the talk. Um, Any progress on the construction of the West African uh, Museum in Benin City? <laughs> yeah, that's also a good question. A good question because from what I know and from my contacts, there's hardly anything that can be called as progress. One of the reasons must be the fact that the original intention of building the Museum of West African Art, I think they call it Edo Museum of West African, was the assumption that all the Benin artifacts that were to be returned would be administered by a trust under certain members of the uh, certain trustees of the board and not by the OBA. And as soon as the OBA realized what was going on, he stepped in and said, no, these things have to come to me because I'm also going to build a museum. Indeed, there is a museum already there. We are going to improve a royal uh, museum. So in view of this constant problems between the OBA and the people, there hasn't been that much as far as I know, uh, hardly any progress. And um, I doubt whether that museum will be built. Some money has been collected, I understand, but I have no information. I'm in contact with people who should know and they say there's no real progress. Right. Okay, this question is a little long, so bear with me. How much have the recent sales at major auction houses like Sotheby's and Christie's factored into the interest of the Nigerian and European institutions now that there are multi-million dollar market uh, very values for Benin bronzes? I don't really understand what the question is aimed at, but these houses have often sought to sell artifacts from Nigeria and other places. And some of these sales have been stopped by protests 
I remember there was one time, uh, I think that was so the best they were going to sell a queen mother, a dear um, artifact. And due to, due to uh, protest by Nigerian students and others, they had to cancel the sale. I don't know how much that this fact um, has gone in, but they are definitely thinking of ways of selling these artifacts without too much publicity. That can be done. But I think this is a question you would have to ask the museums, the um, sellers themselves, how much that is. Because you have to see how much these objects are. But they have been, the Benin objects, for instance, are 10 million uh, worth each of those objects. And they would uh, have to take into account. But this is uh, a matter for the auctioneer houses, auction houses themselves. Yeah. Um, approximately how many um, Benin bronzes, um, legitimate Benin bronzes, um, were stolen in that 1897 um, expedition? That's a very interesting question. When the Oba of Benin sent his brother, I'm talking about the previous Oba, Eria Diou, and not the present, uh, the Oba of Benin area, the who sent his brother, Egum, Edun, Edun, uh, yes, I think he was called Edun, Edun Akenswa. He died last year or so. Uh, the Oba himself, of course, also a year before or so. When he sent his brother to London, to speak to the British Parliament, he gave the figure of the stolen Benin artifacts as 3,000. The Benin Digital Project puts the figures at 5,000. Uh, it is very difficult to know which correct, which figure is correct. I tend to think that the digital uh, project has more or less a correct figure of 5,000. In any way, the Benin people did not keep account of the numbers, but this was in a war. They've been invaded and things have been stolen by the British. So they did not keep any account. And the British themselves who stole all those things also did not keep account. They're in a hurry to get these things and pack them to uh, London. So nobody really can say for sure how many there are. But there are a couple of thousands, I would say. It's, as far as I'm concerned, it's not really important whether they are 4,000, 5,000, 2,000, whatever it is. But that a way is found, a solution is found to give the people of Benin a large amount of their artifacts and to get some for the museums that they can use in their educational uh, purposes. That's all, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna end with this last question that seems like a perfect one to end on. What message and advice do you give this generation to keep the fight going? Uh -huh. That's interesting. You want my public statement on advice? <laughs> okay, I'll give you the public uh, advice. Uh, this generation has to continue the fight. Fortunately, it's not going to be so difficult as it had been in the past because as I say many 
of the museum people themselves are accepting the need for uh, restitution. They are only wondering how much and how many and when and what and all this. But the principle that sometime or the other, the African countries should get some of their stolen assets back is accepted by many academics, by many uh, museum people. What the generation, this generation has to do is to keep pressing. And above all, and that has been my own experience, they should retain contacts with the NGOs and other bodies in the countries where these uh, artifacts are to be found. It's not a fight between Africans and Europeans or any of that thing. It's a question of justice in which we are interested and as much as the younger people. One thing which, one study which has not been done, which I think would be interesting, is to see how much this generation is occupied by art and artifacts, especially African artifacts, as compared to the previous generation. Because we are in a generation which has an access to internet, many of the uh, things which are put on the internet and digital, this and all that, they have access and so can inform themselves. And these things are not so, uh, how should I put it? They do not occupy anymore the position they would have occupied, let's say, in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, in fact, in all countries, you would find people are uh, moving towards this. In Great Britain, which is very interesting, the majority of even Great Britain are interested in restitution. You can take the Parthenon marbles as one example. There has been uh, public polls, opinion polls, over the years, at least about eight, as far as I can see, they have consistently reported that the majority, and these are large majorities of the British people, over 80, overwhelming majority, are in favor of the return of these um, Parthenon marbles to Athens. It seems it's only a certain class of people in Britain, a certain people in the leadership who are and in the British Museum who are not in favor. Thank you. All right, and that's gonna do it for our questions, trying to keep us on schedule. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay. Um Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Poku. And I would like to invite the um, director, CEO, and president of um, the DIA, Detroit Institute of Arts, um, for his closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Ni, and thank you, uh, Dr. Poku, for such an interesting conversation and answers so rich in um, facts, knowledge, and wisdom. It's really amazing. Uh, what you know and how helpful this is for us. As you say, this is not anymore a war. Museums are collaborating with uh, uh, African nations for restitution and uh, Dr. Nick Workapong can attest of that. He's been being, leading the work that the DI has been doing and we will continue to do. It's very important for us. It's very important uh, for our community. And as you were mentioning in some of the parts of your conversation with Dr. Quarkapon, education is very important. We need to continue to educate, tell the stories in our galleries that are important for our community to know, and step and step, step by step, bring things to 
a more just uh, situation. So with that, I just want to thank you again for your presentation and also my warmest uh, congratulations on the Margaret Hurst Demand Award. We are so proud and so honored that you have accepted this award on behalf of the Trade Studio Awards. Thank you so much.